afternoon and welcome to the ELEX webinar titled Using MOUs to Build Partnerships Without Pressure. I'm Allison Armstrong, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, and I will be your host for this afternoon's webinar. Our presenter today is William Cross. He is the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at North Carolina State University, where he provides information on copyright, licensing, open scholarship, and education, and related topics. He has an MA in Technology and Communication, a JD in Law, and an MSLS in Library of Science. Will worked in academic and law libraries, in constitutional, in constitutional litigation, and at the North Carolina Court of Appeals. He is an adjunct instructor in the UNC School of Information and Library of Science. A few things to keep in mind for today's presentation. Today's webinar does not have interactive chat capabilities. If you wish to comment on today's presentation using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. However, we will not be monitoring the Twitter feed. If you have questions for Will, please type them in the question box you see on your screen and he will answer them as time permits at the end of his presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we are on the air will be answered offline and the answers will be sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation within two days. There may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Will. Great, thanks so much. Um, I really apologize for the delay. I'm so excited to be here today to talk to you about using memoranda of understanding to build partnerships in the libraries. I think this is a really important issue, but it's also one that can be sort of intimidating or confusing for people. So I hope the discussion we'll have today will be valuable as it sort of walks you through what MOUs are and how you can use them effectively. If we could go to the next slide, please. Are we up? Great. Uh, so they asked me to include a picture of myself. I apologize for that. I, I don't love pictures of myself. I guess that's true for anybody. But here's a face to go with the voice that you're hearing. Uh, as you heard, I'm Will Cross. I'm a lawyer who's also a librarian. Uh, so I do a lot of work with MOUs, and I'm excited to talk to you about those today. Um, I won't subject you to the picture of me any further. So if we could go on to the next slide. Great, thanks so much. So here's a quick outline of what we're going to be talking about today. I thought we'd start with a discussion about what an MOU, um, a Memorandum of Understanding, I'm just going to say MOU because it's faster, sort of what it is, and in particular how it's different from a standard contract that you deal with. We'll talk about the value of using an MOU, the situations where it can help you out of a bind or help you start a partnership in a different way. Uh, once we have a sense of what MOUs are, We'll start talking about some drafting practices, some, some good practices when you're creating your own MOU or when you're borrowing somebody else's. And then we'll use a couple of case studies. Uh, first, the TRLN single copy program that I'll talk to you a little bit more about. And then the Library of Michigan and Minnesota's regional repository agreement as two examples of, I think, successful MOUs that did something important that it would have been harder to do with the contract. And then I'm going to do my level best to leave at least 10 minutes for questions. I know we got started a little late, um, so I can hang a little late if we need to, but I'm, I'm still going to try to zip through this so that we have time to answer the specific questions that you have. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to do, so let's, let's get into it. If we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you so much. So starting up really at the basics, what is an MOU? What is a Memorandum of Understanding? The easy way to say it is that it's a document that's designed to bring together two parties who are excited to work on a project together. So you have two people or two organizations, two libraries, two universities who say we want to work together, we want to do something, but we're not ready for a contract yet or it would be really tough to put together a contract. So we want to express our intentions and maybe even describe our intentions in some ways, but we don't want the agreement to be legally binding. And so one thing that often is sort of a, a traditional indicator of an MOU is that money doesn't change hands. So with a contract, you're often saying, you have some great materials, 
we want to license those journals, we're going to pay you this much, and you're going to give us access to the journals in this way. That would be a contract. An MOU is for different things. So let's dig into those a little bit more in the next slide, please. Thank you so much. So a, a great way to think about an MOU is as part of this sort of larger continuum of legal promises. Uh, there are some people who will say to you that, that an MOU is just a contract in different clothing, and that's not quite right. There is really a difference between an MOU and something like a contract. You can see from my sort of silly examples here that if you think of this continuo, continuum of promises from the most binding, like a Faustian bargain where you make a deal with some higher power, all the way down to the bottom to just a pinky swear, right, to just a reputational agreement, an MOU is in the middle. It's not as binding as a legal document, like a formal contract, but it's more than sort of saying scout's honor or, or an agreement between two people that's just about reputation. There's more on the line than just you look bad if you break an MOU. We tend to call these agreements soft law agreements because they are sort of like legal agreements but softer, right? And so the MOU is of a piece with things like a letter of intent or a letter of comfort, which uses sort of vague, unenforceable terms. I'm not promising anything specific. I'm just saying we'd like to work together. We'll exercise good faith, that sort of thing or even a record of discussion or a record of meeting where we say we're not going to agree to anything, we just want somebody to write down what was said here. That's the space that an MOU exists in and it's designed to describe uh, guidelines for good behavior rather than specific terms of an agreement. So that's basically what an MOU is and a, a way to think of it as sort of less than a contract but more than just I promise I'll do the right thing. So let's go on to the next slide and talk some more about the value of MOUs. Great, thanks so much. So there are a lot of different reasons that you've seen MOUs start to be really, really popular uh, agreements in recent years, and I want to suggest to you that there are four specific purposes where an MOU is really the best fit for what you want to do. The first is that you'll often see MOUs as sort of the agreement before the agreement, right? If there are complicated issues or very tense issues or maybe parties who don't know each other as well, you can see an MOU as sort of an expression that we're going to do something. It's a promise to make a promise at some level, right? So an expression that we want to work together. We don't want to have to figure out all of the details before we start talking. We just want to write down we have an understanding that we're going to figure this thing out and then eventually we'll create a contract that spells out the specifics of that. So that's one reason to use an MOU. Another reason, and I think it's a really good reason, is to avoid the lawyers. Speaking as a lawyer, the more you can avoid the lawyers, the better, certainly. Um, but also, when you see organizations and institutions that have strict legal regimes or, or strict legal requirements baked into their processes, an MOU is a way to sort of elide, to slip past a lot of that stuff. And there's a really easy example here. My institution at North Carolina State is part of a larger partnership to digitize old and rare books. And there's another organization that I won't name that's sort of the heart of this digitization effort. That organization has requirements built into their contracts that you have to meet. You have to do something called indemnify them, for example. You have to promise that if there's ever a lawsuit, you and not they will be the ones in court. And you have to agree to certain requirements in terms of choice of law and choice of venue. So if, there, if there's ever a lawsuit, you have to go to them instead of them coming to you. Those are really important for that institution, but as a state organization, as a state institution, we can't accept those terms. We're just barred by our state law. So we'd be, we seem like we're at a dead end, right? We want to work together, but we can't accept X, and they have to have X. So the MOU is the way out in that situation then, right? We're not going to create a contract where the lawyers have to get involved and insist that there has to be this indemnification clause where we may not have choice of law. We'll just have an MOU that's lighter and easier that says, hey, this is a cool project. We want to be involved. You want to be involved. Let's work through it that way and not get into the legal technicalities, into the niceties at this point. That's a second space an MOU is really, really valuable as a way of saying we, we can't get the lawyers on the same page, so let's just ignore those folks and do the good stuff we want to do. The third reason you might have an MOU, and this is also, I think, one you're seeing quite a bit, particularly in partnerships with government organizations, is that there are some uh, federal agencies, administrative agencies, etc., that either have to have an MOU or are really tough to deal with if you don't have an MRU, MOU. 
So recently we had a partnership with our naval ROTC folks, which means that we had to negotiate with the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy, as you might imagine, has a lot of really, really complicated, specific terms that are involved. And so their practice is, rather than try to sort out all those legal issues, which, which would make it impossible to have almost any sort of partnership, we expect that you'll use an MOU. So this is sort of like the example from a, from a minute ago, avoiding the lawyers, but it's kind of the reverse as well. Instead of saying there's, there are formal channels that are too complicated, there are situations where the formal channels are use an MOU. We expect you to use an MOU for these reasons. So that's the third reason, right? Because it's the best way to do things. The lawyers want us to do this way. They don't want to have to iron out all those wrinkles. And then the fourth reason, and I think this might be the most common reason that people use MOUs, although I'm going to talk about why this can get sort of tricky, is that people just don't like the word contract very much, right? You'll sometimes see organizations come together and create what looks a lot like a contract, and a court might even say, we think that is in fact a contract, but the word contract is threatening or intimidating or sets people on edge, so we're going to make a contract, we're just not going to call it a contract, we're going to write MOU at the top instead. It's a memorandum of understanding, so everybody feels calmer. Everybody can unclench, right? Um, I'll talk about some of the pitfalls of their of that in a minute, but I think these are four really good reasons, right? To get conversations started, uh, to make partnerships happen where the issues are too confused, to make partnerships with organizations that require them, and then as a way of just setting everybody at ease. Those are the four big reasons to have an MOU. And as we go on to the next slide, I'll talk about some examples of each of these. Thank you so much. So in the 1970s, the United States and the USSR, Russia, started to have talks about nuclear disarmament. These were obviously were really um, delicate negotiations. There was a lot of mistrust on both sides, and the stakes were really, really high. So what they did, and you can see this at the bottom of the slide here, is the first thing they did is they created an MOU. And basically it just said, what this MOU does is it says we're going to create a consultative commission. We have an agreement and all we're agreeing to do is sit down and talk to each other. We're not going to worry about any of the specifics. We're not going to get into any of the details. We just want to get conversations started. So that's a really good example of a delicate negotiation where an MOU is the starter. It's the way you dig into it in the first place. Probably none of us will be involved in negotiating nuclear disarmament, but there are certainly cases when we're dealing with other institutions where there's mistrust or suspicion or, or just enough of a different perspective that an MOU is a great way to say, look, we will figure it out. We haven't figured it out yet, but let's at least agree to start talking. So there's one example. Let's go on to the next slide, and you can see a very different sort of example here. So sort of the other extreme, right? I go out on Friday night with my buddies. We're going to have a bar trivia team, and we want to make sure everybody's going to, going to be nice to each other and be good sports about things. You don't want a contract for that, right? You don't want to, like, I'm not going to take anybody to court because they sniped my answer in the bar trivia. But we do want something written down that says, hey, don't be a jerk about it, right? So an MOU can go from the sort of from the sublime, from the nuclear disarmament option, all the way down to the semi-ridiculous, which is the Friday night bar trivia team. And then I've got one more on the last slide just kind of to be silly. So on this next slide, right, you could even get a little cute about it and make an MOU for this, we for this webinar itself, right? As the speaker, I'm going to present useful information. We're not going to describe what useful is. We're just going to say it's going to be useful. I'm going to use some images so people don't fall asleep too much. I'm going to leave enough time for Q&A. As the listener, you're going to pay attention. You're going to ask smart questions, etc. right? Nobody's going to take anybody to court if my information isn't as useful as I thought it was. Nobody's going to take you to court if your attention wanders for a few minutes. We don't want a contract. And indeed, nobody's signing anything. We just want a document somewhere that says, hey, this is, this is the tenor of the relationship here. We're coming together for this purpose, and this is how we hope to do things. Right? That's another example of an MOU. Notice, though, that this is starting to look a little more like a contract. And it's not just because I use the Times New Roman font here. Right? You're starting to see something that courts might consider a legal contract. So as we go on to the next slide, I want to talk about this issue in particular because it's a really important one. If you really thought I did a bad job in this webinar, and I hope you don't, you could in theory take me to court and if we had both signed the slide before, you could say, we'll promise to provide useful information and this information wasn't useful. 
I say we had a contract, and a court might agree with you. And the reason a court might agree with you is because it's really, really easy to make a legal contract under US law. All you have to have to create a legal contact, contract is offer, acceptance, consideration, and intention. So I have to promise something, you have to promise something back, we both have to get something or abstain from doing something, and we both have to want to have an agreement. That's all it takes. So I've got these examples here, right? The two gentlemen on the top signing formal legal documents. They, of course, have a contract. They're offering something, they're getting something back, there's an exchange, and they have intentionality. But the couple in the middle with the, with the really um, intimidating officiant also has a legally enforceable promise, right? They're both saying, I'm promising to do certain things, and I'm going to get something out of that, and you're going to get something out of that, and we intend to work together, right? That's also a contract, even if there's not a piece of paper. Even if money doesn't change hands, it can still be a contract. Uh, when your parents paid you to do chores or to wash the car or just told you you had to as a condition of living under their roof, that was a contract as well. So it's really, really easy to make a contract. And so very often when you create MOUs, it might say MOU at the top of it, but if it has offer, acceptance, consideration, and some sense of mutuality, you may have created a contract whether you meant to or not. So how can you address that concern? As we go on to the next slide, I'll talk about a couple of different ways to make sure you're not creating a contract unless you want to. The first thing to do to make sure you have truly an MOU and not a formal legally binding contract is to avoid specific legal language or legal terms of art. Right? All those crazy Latin phrases, all those where to fours and you know, those sorts of things start to make a document look more like a contract. And courts will say, if it looks like a duck and sounds like a duck and quacks like a duck, we think it's a duck. Even if you wrote MOU on the side of it, still looks like a duck to us, right? So making it not look like a contract is an important part of that. Um, the other thing you can do, and I've, I've provided the text here because I, th I think it's good for people to have access to this, is one of the four factors we talked about a minute ago, right, along with offer, acceptance, and those mutual benefits, is mutuality, is the intention that you form a contract. So something you can do in your MOU is include a phrase that says, let me be very clear, let me be explicit in this case, we don't mean for this to be a contract. Neither party wants to have a contract. We just want a, an MOU, a soft law agreement. So it says, this document is an MOU, right, as clear as day. That's a great way to make sure what you have is truly an MOU and not a contract. That said, there are a lot of things you can borrow from contract law that I think will make your MOU better. And so if we go on to the next slide, I'll talk to you about some of those things. So on the next slide, you can see here, there are some things from contract law that I think are really useful. The first rule when drafting contracts is to look to the intention of the parties, right? When you're writing up a contract, what you're supposed to do is essentially you're a glorified stenographer, right? You're writing down the intention of the parties. And courts, when they review contracts, start with that same assumption. If there's something that's unclear in a contract, a court will say, we're going to interpret this language in light of the intention of the parties or in order to fulfill the intention of the parties. That's how you should do your MOUs as well. Right? An MOU is a business document first and foremost, so it should describe what we're trying to do. Part of that process is also clarifying the purpose of the agreement, and we're going to dig into this a little bit more as well. But I think it's important in any, in any MOU to have some information that says, this is what we're hoping to do here. This is why we're coming together. Not just we're going to meet on Tuesday, not just um, we're going to figure out this journal issue, but this is the, the reason that we're doing this stuff. That clarity is really important. And related to that, an MOU, and this is true for contracts as well, should be understood as a fail-safe, not as a way to trick somebody into doing something, right? So you you probably shouldn't write a contract and you sh certainly shouldn't write an MOU in a way that surprises anybody. That if there's a disagreement later you can say, ha, I got you, I snuck this little clause into the contract that you weren't expecting and now I've trapped you, right? That's not the purpose of hopefully a contract and certainly an MOU, right? An MOU is supposed to be a good faith document that says, hey, here's what we're hoping to do together. And so the best MOUs or the MOUs that, that come from the best places at some level, exist just to clarify things. They, they, you don't even 
not their legal fault. They just want to be able to go, oh yeah, that's why we're doing it. Right? These different track ideas that fit very well when you're designing an MOU as well. And then the last thing to say is, is when you're talking about a contract, there's a principle that, that is very deeply held in the law that if you're interpreting a contract, you want to look at, quote, the four corners of the agreement. In other words, if it's not on that page, you're not bound to do it. Uh, in law school, the cynical definition they give you of this is the salesman is lying to you, right? If the salesman promised something but it didn't show up in the agreement, the contract and not what the salesman promised is going to be controlling. You can only look in the four corners of the document itself. And when we're drafting MOUs and looking at MOUs, I think a similar principle should apply. We're going to have conversations. There's going to be back and forth through email or on the phone. But what we put in the MOU should be the final product, should be the result that sums up all of our conversations. And if we didn't put it in the MOU, we shouldn't expect that to be the case, right? If it didn't make it into those four corners, we should say that's still open for discussion. We don't have agreement. So those are things that exist in contract law that I think help you make stronger and more effective MOUs. So hopefully now you have a sense of what an MOU is, when it's useful. Let's now turn and talk a little bit about how to draft an MOU, right? We have a sense of what it is, so on the next slide we'll start talking about how to do it. And I want to pause here and, and provide an anecdote that I always find really useful. This comes from a man named Steve McDonald, who's the general counsel at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, like me, he's a lawyer, and like me, he gets a lot of people who come in with pieces of paper that they shove in his face and they say, is this right? Is this good? Is this contract okay? Can we sign this? And what Steve always says is, I have two questions for you. Question one, have you read it? And question two, what do you want it to say? And very often he gets a response, no, I haven't read it and I'm not sure. You're the lawyer. You should tell me if it's a good contract or not. And his response then is always, then it's not a good contract. The person drafting an MOU isn't the person who's making the big decisions. And the thing that makes an MOU successful isn't whether it has just the right turn of phrase or the right uh, terminology or term of art. The thing that makes a good MOU is that the parties understand it and that it reflects what they're trying to do. It is a document that should describe something that's already there, not create something that people then have to follow because it says it on the piece of paper. So when you start drafting an MOU, the first question you should ask yourself is, what do I want it to say? What should it say? And then start digging into, okay, now that I know what I want to communicate, here's the way I'm going to communicate it. So that's, I think, a really important place to start because very often, particularly if you're working with a counsel's office or somebody else, there will be an attempt by the lawyers to drive progress forward, to say, okay, we've got this template, we're going to start with that and go from there. And you need to be comfortable saying, no, we need to start with our intention and then put that down on paper, not start with the piece of paper and try to figure out intention from there. So that's sort of my caution at the beginning of this drafting process. Let's go on to the next slide and I'll tell you one more thing I want you to keep in mind as you're doing the drafting. And this thing is also, I think, uh, common sense in one sense, but can be easy to, to get lost in as well. A lot of people, again, particularly attorneys or people who work with attorneys, get hung up on the idea of magic words. You've got to have the recitals at the beginning, the wherefores, or you've got to have this particular term of art or this type of jargon. And I want to suggest to you that particularly with something like an MOU, with a soft law agreement, that's the wrong way to go. Instead, what you want to do is to write in plain English, to talk to each other like human beings, right? And I list here two reasons that it's important not to throw in weird Latin phrases and jargon, but to write like one person almost sending an email to another person. The first, of course, is that the technical meanings can obscure your intention, right? Particularly if you're borrowing phrases that you only sort of know what they mean, or you don't have a full sense of the implications of them, right? A phrase like um, in a timely fashion, or good faith, or due diligence. Those all have very specific technical legal meanings. And if you say we need to make sure to use the legal phrase without knowing all the details of those legal meanings, you can actually end up writing something that gets in the way of what you're trying to say. 
right? In the same way that if you borrow a really uh, long word, you go to the thesaurus and borrow a really long word, there can be a nuance that you miss. And because this document isn't a chance for the lawyers to show off their fancy writing skills, this document is instead a chance for you, the people doing stuff, to actually communicate your intentions. Technical terms and jargon get in the way. The other reason, of course, that using those legal magic words can be a problem is because it makes it look more and more like a contract, right? That, this goes back to the idea we talked about before that you don't want to have something that looks and sounds and walks too much like a duck because then a court might think it's a duck. Instead, you want something that looks and sounds like two parties that have come together and said, hey, this is a great project. Let's talk about how we're going to do it. So don't get hung up on those magic words, and if somebody else that you're working with in the process gets really excited, push back a little bit and say, hey, don't let the words get in the way of the intention in this case. So if, as we move on to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about who should be involved in drafting an MOU. This is going to vary pretty significantly across different institutions. Um, one thing that is common is it should never be just one person drafting an MOU, right? It's for sure a team sport, and I really want to emphasize that. You need all the different colors from your colored pencil set, if you like the metaphor here, right? Um, if you have a counsel's office or an outside attorney, it can't hurt to have those people involved. And indeed, a lot of institutions, uh, both because they're concerned that there will be a contact, contract created and or because there are specific institutional requirements for creating an MOU, say, we want counsel's office at least to review it. I've suggested they shouldn't drive the process, but certainly there's a role for them to play. Uh, administration should almost certainly be involved as well. Um, and if you do happen to have a lawyer in the library, right, I'm the lawyer in my library, um, and an increasing number of institutions have somebody who knows both the library side and the law side, that's a great person to have involved because they can make those connections, right? You don't want just the lawyers doing the work because they don't understand the library stuff, but you probably don't want just the librarians either because you need some of that legal expertise at least to know what, what things to avoid, what terms not to use, right? But the most important group is the group here at the bottom, the people actually doing stuff, right? If an MOU is, unlike a contract in a lot of ways, about a low-key expression of how we hope to work together, the people actually working together should be front and center, right? So I know too many institutions that an MOU is something that the administration and the council's office get together and they draft, and then at the very end of the process, they give the MOU to the people doing stuff and say, okay, here are your marching orders, do that. And that almost always goes badly, right? Because the people on the ground go, whoa, you promised something we don't think makes sense, or you didn't talk about an issue we think we really need to talk about some more, right? So, so this sort of team sport aspect that is led by the people who are actually going to be doing the things described in the MOU, I think is really, really critical. And the other people can and should be involved as well, but start on the ground, as it were. As we go on to the next slide, um, Another question that I get quite a bit when we talk about MOUs is, what about starting with a template? There are a bunch, a bunch of templates out there. This is the IFLA uh, Library Advocacy Toolkit template. It's a very good one. I'm going to show you one at the end that I think is especially nice as well. I think there's a lot of value in using templates in this case, not particularly because you want to borrow specific language. Again, an MOU should sound like the way you and your organization would express something, not the way IFLA would express it, but because it's a great way to think about what needs to be in there, right? A template will say, we're going to talk about A, B, C, and D, and you might go, oh, yeah, we thought about A, B, and D, but I hadn't thought about C. Yeah, we should, we should think about that some more, right? So a template is a nice way to demystify the issue, to give you some, some text and some organization, some section headings at least, to start with, but please, please, please don't stop there because every template is designed as a starting place, not as the final agreement. Um, and we've seen some really, really funny examples of people stopping with the template. I'll share one of them with you now just because it, it sort of amuses me and I hope it will amuse you as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I was working with a professor a few years ago who was signing a publication agreement with a publisher. He was going to write a book, and it was a book on 20th century Jewish literature. And he read the contract, and it talked about, uh, we're going to publish the book, and these are the royalties you're going to get, and a lot of things that you would expect to see in a publication agreement. But he also saw a section that he was a little surprised to see. He saw a section where it said he was giving the publisher all rights to 
comic books, movies, and theme parks. And he, he came to me and he said, really? Comic book? Are, are they planning to do comic books and movies and theme parks of my book on 20th century Jewish literature? And if we can go to the next slide, I'll sort of show you what flashed through his head. He said, are they really planning to make, uh, you know, beautiful Saul Bellow land, <laughs> right? Is, is that their intention? And the response is no, of course not. What happened was that the publisher had borrowed a contract from a graphic novel company and had just left the language in there without reading it. So they had no intention of creating Saul Bellow theme park or anything like that. They just had borrowed a template and not changed it. And that, was, that made them look a little bit silly. There weren't any major concerns, right? It was easy enough to say, sure, if you decide to make a graphic novel of my scholarly work, you can have those rights, but that, that's sort of a silly example. You can see much more serious examples if you borrow an MOU template and don't change it of uh, agreeing to terms that either are nonsensical or that really put you at a disadvantage or other situations where borrowing and not really reading, understanding, and most importantly, changing the terms is a problem. So as I talk about the IFLA template, template a minute ago, as I talk about the template from UCLA, we're going to look at it at the end of the discussion, assuming we have time. Um, don't forget that that's the starting point, not the end point. It's not like you need to just fill in the blanks and you're done. It's here's one suggestion for how to approach the issue. So we've got our intention pretty clear. We've got our parties who are going to be involved pretty clear, and we've got a template or similar to help us think through the issues. Let's go on to the next slide and get into the nitty-gritty now. So when you start drafting an MOU, I want to suggest that you start with the sort of famous five W's. Uh, you see journalists use these five W's a lot. Uh, novelists, you'll see them use them as well. Lawyers sometimes. And they actually date back to uh, the classical period, and you can see my little Latin over here on the side. Um, but your MOU should answer, and should indeed should be built around these questions. Who, what, where, when, why, how, and then add two more to those as well. How much and what if. And let's go on to the next slide and dig into those a little bit, right? So, who? Who's going to be involved? Your MOU should say, this institution and this institution intend to work together. Or, this unit and this unit intend to work together, right? Who is involved? Really important to include. Next, what are we trying to do? Right? We talked about this a little bit already. If intention is so important, what are we trying to accomplish here in, in very specific terms? We want to digitize books. Right? We want to collaborate on collections so that we can each build to our strengths a little more. Right? What are these specific nitty-gritty things that we want to do? Where is this taking place, right? Are we going to do it within our respective libraries? Are we going to have meetings that occur regularly? If so, who's going to host those, right? The where stuff is important. When is also important. Are we starting right away? Are we starting when a new person is hired or at the beginning of the fiscal year? And then what deadlines exist, right? Are we going to check in every month? Are we going to check in every year? Are we going to be sitting in the same office so we don't need to worry about this so much, right? When is important? And then why, I think, is really, really critical. And it's different from what, right? What are we trying to do is what are the specific deliverables, right? What are we trying to see as outcomes? Why is much higher level? Why are we getting together in the first place? What's the intention in this case, right? What are we gonna, how are we going to benefit in a big picture sense? What brings us to the table to talk about this? Uh, maybe the most important then is the how. How are we actually going to get it done? An MOU, unlike a contract, might not get into as many of the very clear specifics. Right? We're going to meet on Tuesday, January 7th. But it's going to be at least we agree to meet regularly and talk through these issues and then begin piloting a project. Right? how to the extent that's appropriate for the specific uh, agreement. How much is different from contracts in that if you were talking about a contract, how much would be generally about money, right? I want to license these journals from Springer. Springer wants X dollars from us. It would be fairly straightforward. You would probably won't have that. I told you early on that MOUs generally don't involve money changing hands. But how much can be very important in terms of what are we willing to commit? Right. When do we start saying this just isn't working for us? We need to step back and think about it more. And that leads naturally into what if it doesn't work out, right? If 
we meet one time and we don't get everything solved, is that okay? We know this is an ongoing process. Or if we meet one time, do we say, well, it was a trial balloon and we let, let go of our little balloon and it popped five feet into the air, oh well, we'll, we'll go our separate ways, right? So answering those questions, those, the five W's and then the three more I have there, I think should make up the meat of your MOU. And if you borrow an existing template and then fill those in, that's fine. Or if you just start from scratch, you could almost start from scratch and use those questions to organize your discussion. So that's the specifics of drafting an MOU, is you start with the intention and then build out in a way that answers these questions. Let's go on to the next slide and look at a couple case studies of what these MOUs might look like. The first example I want to give you is one that actually is close to home for me. Uh, there's an organization that was founded several decades ago called the Triangle Research Libraries Network, or TRLN. And TRLN is made up of North Carolina State, of UNC Chapel Hill, of Duke, and of North Carolina Central. And one of the first things they did, they said, we, want, we think we're all within, you know, 30 miles of each other, we ought to be working together. And we think in particular our collections folks should be working together. We need to start thinking about a collaborative collection across our different libraries. So they used two different MOUs to create and solidify that partnership. The first MOU was let's create TRLN, and the second was now let's talk about collaborative collections. So I'm going to talk you through each of those MOUs, what they wanted to do, and then show you what those MOUs actually look like. So let's go on to the next slide and talk about the, the creating the TRLN part. So the first thing the four libraries did was they got together and they said, we think we should have an organization like this, right? And this is a classic MOU situation. We don't even know what we're going to do together yet. We're not agreeing to any particular project. We just think we should work together, right? And so they got together and they hashed out those questions we talked about. Who's going to be involved? The four institution libraries that we talked about. What are we doing? We're creating a partnership for library collaboration. So the outcome of the MOU is we should have a partnership at the end of it. Where is it going to happen? Well, each library is going to carry some work. And also there's going to be work done across what we call the research triangle, which is this area in the middle of the state of North Carolina where we have all these great institutions of higher education. Right, when is it happening? As soon as practical and we expect it to be ongoing. Why are we doing this? Well, we think it's going to be more efficient and we think we're going to have these shared aims, so that's really important. We're going to do it, as I say, through, through a strategic partnership and I'll point to some of the specifics when we look at the MOU. How much are we going to, willing to sort of invest here? Uh, we recognize there are going to be annual dues, so there is a little bit of money here, which is not always the case in an MOU, but it was true here. And we also know there's going to be a time commitment involved. And then finally, we can always reconsider terms or withdraw, right? We're just promising to create this organization. We're not promising it's going to do anything, right? So that's how they walked through those questions. As we go on to the next slide, let's look through the way they took those questions and turned them into an actual MOU. So here, and I hope you all can read this. It's, it's fairly legible on my screen, but if you can't now, I'm going to point out the major sort of factors here as well. So this is the memorandum of understanding concerning the creation of TRLN. You can see they start at the top here with the who question. Who's involved? This is a cooperative endeavor between these institutions, right? And then they have a big, big what section here, sort of what and why mixed. They start off with this historical note, which is designed to say, this is where we are, this is what we're doing, this is what we're about. That goes to the intention idea I talked about. And then below that, they actually have a specific mission as well. They say, this is specifically what we want to do in the past. This is how we came together. And now we're gathered here today to do this thing, right? The who and the what. As you go further on, you can see they start to get into the specifics a little more with the requirements for membership. Uh, they've got how much here in terms of annual dues and the assessments and these sorts of things. And also some what if stuff. What if we can't pay? What if we don't think it's working out for us anymore, right? You can start to see those questions pop up. And now let's go on to the next slide and we can see the rest of this agreement and see the rest of the questions kind of show up. Great, thank you. So here you see the, the when and the how and some more of the why come up. You can see that they've got the when here with your meetings. We're going to have annual meetings. We're going to have special meetings. Um, here's what a quorum looks like in that, like in that context as well. Um, a lot more how. You can see that like a lot of MOUs, this is, this is a lot of how built in here. But how are we going to make decisions on this issue? What's the council going to do? How? And then they end it. They finish. And I think this is really great with why. 
they start at the beginning with the high level. This is what we're trying to do in a general sense. This is what brings us together. Then they talk about what they're going to be doing, the work of TRLN. And then they finish with these are the specific goals. We've just described a process that we're both committing or we're all committing to be involved with. This is what we hope comes out of the process. Our goals, we're going to look at scope in a different way. We're going to create new services. We're going to do these sorts of things. So that's a great example of an MOU that starts with the intention, describes what the partnership is going to be about in a way that you wouldn't want to have a contract necessarily, and then concludes with, and therefore we've got our why, which also feeds the partnership sort of kicking off into action. Right? If you had anything but this goal section, you'd still have a good agreement, but the people who were at those first meetings of the advisory council might say, well, I, uh, I guess we have to figure out what we're doing here. But they didn't have to do that. They had the goals section that said, this is why we're doing it. So that's the first MOU, the creating the TRLM MOU. About a decade later, they said, now that we've got TRLN up and running and we think it's doing well, now let's start talking about the collections issue. Uh, and let's go on to the next slide here and we can talk about that. They said specifically we want to create something we're going to call the single copy program. And the idea is each of the institutions is going to essentially buy to their collecting strengths so that other institutions in TRLN can leverage those strengths. So at North Carolina State, we're very strong in STEM materials, for example, whereas at UNC Chapel Hill, they're really strong in the humanities. Rather than create duplicative collections, they said North Carolina State will build the strongest STEM collection they can, UNC Chapel Hill the strongest humanities, with the expectation that we can loan back and forth, right? So we're, each, we're just going to buy a single copy across TRLN. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty standard uh, agreement or arrangement, and I think it's a really productive one to do. You can see, once again, they came back to these questions we talked about before. Same people involved, uh, same idea of a partnership now for collections. Same place, we're going to start as soon as possible. Um, not just efficiency in the why, but also building on collection strength. This idea that we're not just doing the stuff T.R. Allen is doing generally, we're doing something that benefits our collections folks specifically. That's important. And then how much is required by law, and then we can always reconsider. And then we go on to the next slide, and you can see um, the way that MOU sort of shook out. And again, it's going to look pretty similar. We're going to start at the top with a who. <coughs> Excuse me. You notice, though, this starts to look a little more like a contract. You're starting to see whereases a little more, and a big, in all caps, now, therefore, right? It's starting to take more of a shape of a contract, which I think reflects the fact that there was a more robust program that the lawyers had taken some more interest in. I think it still works very well as an MOU, but notice how the form changes. An MOU doesn't have to take a certain form. It just has to do certain things. And, and again, we've got the who here, the what and why, um, and whereas is a fine sort of lawyery sounding way to describe the why and what, right? Whereas we want to do this thing is a different way to say we want to do this thing. Um, the how here in section C, the how much in terms of costs, and then the what if down at the bottom, the risk of loss and other things. So that's, that's an example of an MOU that grew out of an organization that was itself created by an MOU. So you can see MOUs at different stages in a project. Uh, we're running a little short on time. Let's go ahead and look at the second one, but I'm going to zip through it a little bit more quickly. Um, if you have questions about this second example, I'm happy to dig into those in our Q&A, but I want to be respectful of that Q&A time as well. So the second partnership here has to do with fulfilling regional depository services. Uh, as you know, government agencies often use libraries as a place to deposit their materials, and this is an example, moving on to the next slide, where uh, the University of Minnesota agreed to be the repository for the Library of Michigan. You can see here again they, do, they make a similar sort of move into these questions. Who's going to be involved? What are we doing here? Where is it going to be? Why are we doing it? The statutory requirements part is really important. Uh, we're going to do storage, copying, and other services as required again by statute. So they, had, they addressed those same set of questions, who, what, where, when, why, how, much, etc. And then as we go on to the next slide, you can see the way this MOU looks, right? And again, <coughs> they also start with who, which I think is fairly common, and why. So again, we are these people, we're coming together for this purpose is a great way to do it. They have much more focus on the where, because of course we're talking about uh, a deposit of government materials from a specific state. So there's, we're going to need to talk much more about how the citizens of the state get access to those materials. 
Um, they have also done something that looks a little more like a contract, but I think is smart to do, particularly when there are two partners in this way. Their terms are divided into, this is what Michigan is going to do. This is what Minnesota is going to do, right? That's a nice way to, to arrange it so that it's clear for each party what they're going to be doing. It does start to look a lot more like a contract. And this, I think, is a document that is edging um, a little precariously close, perhaps, to looking like a contract. And indeed, I could imagine um, one or both of the parties saying, no, actually, we think this should be understood like a contract in a lot of ways. If, if Minnesota stopped fulfilling their obligations and suddenly the Library of Michigan was left in a bind, they might, in fact, go to a court and say, hey, court, we, we worked with these people to create a relationship. They're not holding up their end. That's why there's trouble, right? So this, this they call it an MOU. This is an example of one that's much closer to the other. And as I say, if you have specific questions about this one, we can dig in more in the Q&A. But let's get through these last couple of slides so that you do have the full 10 minutes to ask your questions. I promised you a great place to start as a template, and I think the UCLA's Rights Toolkit is a wonderful place to start. The document they have there, I think, is a really, really good document that does a great job of delineating each section in terms of the way we've talked about them. Why, they call it purpose at the beginning. How, responsibilities of the parties, general terms, et cetera, right? This is a great place to start. Uh, and if you just Google UCLA Rights Toolkit MOU, this will pop up right away. It's a really, really good document. Um, so if you, if you don't want to start from scratch, or if your own institution doesn't have a template, and that's another thing to say is most institutions or many institutions do have an institution-specific template, obviously that's a great place to start too. Um, this is also a fine place to start this rights toolkit I talked about. So let's go on to my sort of final thought before we dig into the questions here. Um, I'm going to defer to the scholar, uh, Mr. Robert Van Winkle, who famously admonished us to stop, collaborate, and listen. Um, this is really important. As you get into the specifics of an MOU, it can be easy to get lost in those details and not focus on creating a document that works for everybody. And in fact, if you're dealing with a contract attorney or even somebody in the library who does licensing, so often we deal with contracts and licenses, licenses in an adversarial mode. There's a sense that we need to see what we can get for us out of this document. The fundamental way that an MOU is different from a contract is that the intention of the parties should be different. Your intention when drafting an MOU or responding to an MOU or changing an MOU shouldn't be, they've made their offer, now let's counter offer. The intention should be, let's put our heads together and talk about how we can be most productive and most successful. So as you dig into your five W's questions, as you look at templates, as you think about other things, never forget uh, Mr. Robert Van Winkle's admonition here to make sure that you're thinking about what's going to make the project a success, not just what are the best terms we can get. So that's the last thing I wanted to say about MOUs on my end. We can turn now to the next slide and questions. Um, and if you want to send in questions to me, uh, it might be safer for, for one of the other moderators to select the question since it sounds like my screen is not showing up well. So if you have questions, go ahead and send them in through the software. And as questions start to pop up, if you will tell me what questions I can answer, I'd love to answer them. Yep. That sounds great. If you'll um, enter your questions in the questions box. And in the meantime, I, I wanted to say I appreciate you pointing out the collaborative aspect of MOUs and, and trying to work together. And yeah, while we're waiting you. for questions, I thought I would ask, it, with the TRLN um, MOU. Mm -hmm. I assume you were you were working on that. That was actually before my time. That this okay. happened in the 80s. Um, but okay. I know some of the people who were working on it, so I can give you some context if you'd like. So I was wondering if there was anything in retrospect that that you might have done differently. Sure, that's a really good question. Um, I think the and it's often the saving grace of MOUs, and one of the things that makes MOUs uh, better than contracts in a lot of cases is they erred on the side of the general. What the MOU tended to say was 
we agree to figure this issue out, or we agree to sit down together and talk about these issues. So I think what they did that was really smart was not say we agree to solve this problem by doing X, or even we agree to solve the specific problem that exists here in 1987, but more we agree that we're on the same team and we're going to figure this stuff out together. Um, so the one big change I can say they made was that at first it was only three of the four institutions and they added the fourth institution later. So there is, there's actually a modified version of the MOU that says we agree along with the other things to add this fourth institution to the mix as well. But, but I think that's a great example of an MOU that said we know if we spell everything out, we're going to look dumb in five or ten years, so let's not spell those things out. That's, if we get to the point where we need a contract, we can do it, but for right now, this is just a memorandum that says we all want to work together. I kind of skipped your question. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so we have some questions now. The first one is, how does an MOA differ from an MOU? Mm, that's a good question. Um, Generally, it doesn't substantially differ. Generally, there are two different words for the same thing. And I think if we go back to my earlier slides, and if this is hard to do, don't worry about it, um, but this is slide five where I talk about that continuum of promises uh, with legally binding at the top, soft law, and reputation down there. <clears throat> I list memorandum of understanding slash agreement as sort of defining guidelines of, for behavior. Um, some institutions choose to define them differently, and certainly there are some cases where, right, if you, if you have something in your institution that says you must use a memorandum of understanding to address this issue, you should call it an MOU and not an MOA. But the parlance that I see generally suggests that those are both essentially comparable things in the same way that a letter, letter of intent and a letter of comfort are the same thing, and that a record of discussion or record of meeting tend to be the same thing. They're just different ways of describing these essentially similar soft law agreements. Great question, though. Okay, next question. We've got, let's see, in seeing the examples of some rather extensive MOUs, I'm having some difficulty understanding the difference between them and contracts. Is the difference primarily that contracts are legally binding and parties could go to court if they're not followed? That's a big part of it, for sure. So the intention with an MOU is we don't want a formal contract. We want something less than that. <clears throat> and the consequence of that is that MOUs tend to be written slightly differently. right? You, you tend to see terms that are more like, we agree to meet to discuss this issue, or we, we're going to in the spirit of cooperation, we're coming together to figure this out, whereas a contract would have very specific terms. We have to meet at this time to do this thing, etc. Uh, that said, I think your confusion is really, really natural, right? We talked earlier as well about the way that it's really, really easy to get a contract, that in some sense, uh, offer acceptance and consideration uh, is all it takes. So, particularly that last MOU we looked at, I, I would suggest looks a lot like a contract, and the more you use uh, contract language, the more you have terms about uh, this offer, this acceptance, this consideration, etc., the more likely a court is to consider an MOU to be a contract. If what you intend is, we just want an agreement, we don't care what we call it, contract makes people uncomfortable, we're going to call it an MOU, then don't sweat it. Just write the agreement and follow it along. If your intention is, I want something that's not a contract, it's important to me that no matter how much I spell out, that this not be something we take, we be able to take to court. What I suggest you do is use that, the language I suggested in slide 11. This document is an MOU and is not intended to create binding or legal obligations on either party. Right. So. It's, it's a distinction that can get pretty blurry, both in terms of substance and because of sort of the way the law works. I think it's okay that that distinction is blurry a lot of the time, but when it's important to you that those lines be really, really clear, um, what you do is just underline it. Just say it's important to us that these lines be clear. So the first line in our document or the last line in our document is, we want to be explicit. This isn't a contract. This doesn't create binding legal obligations. Um, so that's the way to address that issue. But you're exactly right that all of the MOUs I showed you could have been changed a bit and called contracts and looked a lot like contracts. So that's the nature of the soft law agreement, is we want something that looks a lot like an agreement but is treated differently. And so finding that balance um, takes some deliberate action, and I hope I've given you some, some tips on how to be deliberate in that action. Great. Thank you. 
And this is from Nate Wise at BYU Idaho. He said, hey, "Great job." Thanks, Nate. Um, wondering how close to come to co the contract line, and how you, do you delineate the difference, and how you should advise administrators in a, in creating MOUs with other institutions in this regard. So, so that's that's uh, that question of how close to the contract line is it? Uh, very, very close to the contract line. Sometimes, right? Sometimes the only difference between a contract and an MOU is a line that says we intend for this to be an MOU, right? Um, so it's the intention is that it's something different, but because both creating a contract and the terms of an MOU are so capacious and flexible, it's possible to accidentally create one when you, may, when you mean to create the other. So the explicit statement, I mean for this to be X or Y, is important when the distinction is important, but as I say, if you, if you don't care, if you just want an agreement and that word contract makes people uncomfortable, call it an MOU, write a contract and move on. The second part of your question, Nate, about the administrative lines, I think is the really, really interesting and important one, because Administrators often see a very substantial difference between a contract and an MOU, and your counsel's office also often sees a very substantial difference between those two things. So that's when you want to get those people involved, but not let them drive the train, right? Hey, counsel's office, we're creating an MOU. We know that has a technical meaning at your institution. Let's talk together about what we want to get done and the way to draft that so that by the terms of your specific counsel's office, it's an MOU and not a contract. From a legal, how would a judge rule standpoint, I think the things I've talked about, the offer acceptance stuff, and then the explicit language addresses the issue. In terms of the institution specific stuff, that's about the relationship and having those conversations and baking that in at the beginning of the process. Great, thank you. And what is the legal standing of an MOU in the U.S.? The legal standing of an MOU in the U.S., if it is truly an MOU, it is a soft law agreement, as we talked about before. So it's something you probably couldn't take to court, often because the guidelines for behavior are so nonspecific, right? So we'll agree to work together. Well, what does that mean, right? How, how could a court enforce the promise to work together? Are they going to mandate that you have five meetings where three people come and talk for an hour, right? That, that would be really hard to mandate. So the more an MOU reflects that idea of abstract guidelines, statements of good faith and intention, the more courts will understand it as an MOU that they will not enforce. But the more you have specific terms or the inclusion of money or payment, these sorts of things, the more a court will say, you might have called that an MOU, but that's a legally binding contract. Does that make sense? We've had a couple versions of that question, and so I'm afraid I'm not explaining it well. Uh, if there are specific parts of it that, that I'm not explaining well, tell me, and I can talk some more about those things as well. Great. Um, I'm working on a project run by the state library that involves partner libraries. Should I have an MOU for each library between that library and the state library, or one MOU with this starting list of participating libraries which can be amended as partners come and go? I would tend towards the latter. I think of an MOU as about an understanding related to a project rather than about an understanding between two institutions. Now, there certainly could be cases where the nature of the project is these two institutions are working together in one very specific way. A third institution is a really different kind of partner. And in that case, you might say, I want MOUs with each of the different institutions. Um, as I say, my preference is fewer documents that describe the project rather than one document for each of the different parties makes more sense. Uh, if your administration, though, says oh, we prefer to do the other way, that's fine, right? One of the great things about an MOU being soft law rather than a formal contract is you have a lot more discretion to do it in the way that makes people the most comfortable. So my own personal preference is for one central MOU, as we did with TRLN, right? We didn't say there's an MOU between Carolina and North Carolina State. There's an MOU between Duke and North Carolina Central. We said there's one MOU for the TRLN project generally, and the three institutions all agreed to it. And then when a fourth institution entered play, we just added them to the existing agreement. Uh, that, I think, is uh, the, the most straightforward way to do it. But if your administration wants to do it differently, there's nothing wrong with that either. Thank you. 
about the final MOU we looked at. I was okay. just wondering about the part that was identified as the what section. It looked like a how section. I sure. We can bring that up. So the sorry, so we're on slide 28, the Michigan. Uh, so who, why, where, why, how, when, what, if. Um, I'm not sure. Can can you type into the box a little bit more about your your concern? I'm I'm struggling a little here, but that doesn't mean I mean I'm sure I'm just missing something. Which specific section? And if we could pull up slide 28, if that's possible, that would be really helpful so we can all be looking at the same thing. I will say while we're typing, you're, you're quite right that the distinctions can be um, very, very narrow and artificial at some level as well. Um, you'll also see language that does multiple things, right? You'll see language, the historical section, for example, might describe both the why and the how, or document that is both, we're going to do it this way until it falls apart that you could call how and what if. So I didn't mean to introduce those questions as sort of a formal, you have to do A and then B and then C. I meant to, them, I meant to suggest them as a way to formulate what you're doing and how it's going to happen, right? To use those five questions to define the, the intellectual space or the project space. Um, so I wouldn't get too hung up on is it a why or a, you know, is, is it a when or a where kind of thing or whatever. I, I, I don't think the artificiality should get in the way of what I hope is a useful tool for thinking through how we want to phrase this stuff. Okay, I hope that helped. And um, so it says, so the arrow points to section 10 and 11. Okay. What if? Sure, the what if section what 10 and 11. Like so I think you're right. I, I think that might be better described in a different way. I think uh, it, you could think of it as what if in terms of if these things don't happen, right? And, and I 10 and 11 both are about uh, revision to reflect changes, and I think the changes points to the what if section. Um, and then if needs are not met, what if happens as well. But that's a perfect example of there's some how in there, there's some when in there, there's some what if in there as well. I, I, I wouldn't have an MOU that is like sections are where, who, why, what if. I would craft an MOU that makes sure it answers all of those questions in a clear way. So that's appreciate you raising that nuance. I think it's really important. Thank you. And can you give an example of an MOU where money is exchanged? Uh, I shouldn't be able to because uh, if you exchange money, it tends to look a lot more like a contract. So if, if I were in a relationship where there was an expectation that money was going to be exchanged, I would say this doesn't look like a great candidate for being an MOU. This looks like the sort of thing that, would, that a formal legal contract is involved. We certainly, though, do see MOUs where money is committed, though, right? If you think about TRLN, we promised to have meetings, we promised to have gatherings, and when you talk about the single copy collecting program, we're, we're promising to buy books, right? But we're not promising to exchange money between one party and another party. We're promising to do the collection stuff we're already doing in a way that reflects our shared purpose. So it's hard to think of examples where you're exchanging money and it doesn't start to look like a contract because that level of specificity looks like a contract to courts and be contracts so often are focused on money, um, the, the inclusion of an exchange of money tends to push very, very hard towards an interpretation that that's probably a contract. So, so probably I couldn't think of an example because that would be, that would be very much in tension with the purpose of an MOE. Okay, thank you. And we have one last question. Great. Before we wrap up, so how do MOUs work within the same institutions? even when money changes hands, so I'm not sure. Sure, that, I mean, that's a really good question, that we talk about MOUs as being about uniting diverse parties, and indeed MOUs sort of grow out of, or at least there's a major branch of MOUs, that's designed specifically for the international context, right? We can't possibly get the US and the USSR's attorneys together and figure out the international law stuff. That would take forever, definitely an MOU. Um, 
So you tend to see them when there's distance between the parties as a way of saying we don't have a strong relationship. We hope the MOU will help knit the relationship together. But there are certainly cases where MOUs are used within a particular institution, um, and they tend to be used for the sort of things we talked about earlier, right, where you are um, either figuring things out or you want to avoid the lawyers, right? There's a sense one of two things is happening. Either, one, it gets really complicated to have partnerships within the institution because the lines get crossed so much. A great example of that is when the Army and Navy work together. They almost always use an MOU because both of those parties have so much red tape involved that working within the family in that way can get incredibly complicated. So that's one place where an MOU is really useful within an institution. The other side of that, though, is very often in an institution, um, we're all already on the same team. Right? I, I don't need to have a contract with my office mate or with another department in my library. We're already on the same team. So a soft law agreement is a way of reflecting the fact that, yeah, we're already working together. Let's just all agree to you know, not use up all the cream in the refrigerator and, you know, and without buying more or something like that. Right? So, so a very informal, casual agreement. So, so both the things are too complicated when our institution tries to work together, um, and that actually comes up at my institution a lot. They say we're a collection of 10 departments rather than one university. I think a lot of institutions are in that case. Or the other extreme, we already have a very clear relationship. It would be ridiculous to like draft a formal legal contract in this case. We'll do an MOU instead. Great. Thank you. Great. If there are no other questions, I really appreciate uh, the discussion today. If you have further questions later on, feel free to send them along um, here or to me directly at North Carolina State, and I'm happy to chat. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Will, for presenting today, and thank you to all of our attendees. I apologize for the technical difficulties, and I appreciate you guys hanging in there with us. We hope you found today's session interesting and useful, and you will soon receive a short online evaluation form, please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee plan new educational offerings. Information about all ELECTS webinars can be found on the ELECTS homepage and suggestions for webinars and other continuing education opportunities are welcome at any time. I would like to thank Eva Sorrell and Wanda Jazeri and Megan Doherty um, for produ providing technical support in today's webinar. The support that they provide makes it possible for us to present these webinars fairly smoothly. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this afternoon and we hope that you will participate in other continuing education offerings again in the future. <laughs>